Investors Chronicle. Companies and market show, welcome back. Our result of the week this week is ASOS. Retail writer Madeline Taylor is in the studio to help us break down that. A wash with cash. Will flush miners opt for deals, developments, or dividends? That's our long read this week, written by one Alex Hamer. Alex is also in the studio. And then we take a quick look at the UK defence and aviation industry. Companies and Market Show, welcome back, everyone. Joining me in the studio, Alex Hamer. Hello, Alex. Hey. Making their podcast debut, Madeline Taylor. Hello. Hello. Tried to book you twice before now, but didn't make it happen. I know. I'll try try to be less elusive in the future. It's okay. At least we got you now. And then, uh, as normal, Mark Robinson. Hi, Mark. Hi, John. And Alex Newman. Nothing normal about Mark. Alex Newman. Hi. Yes. Hi, John. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Um, it's Wednesday, the 13th of April, as we record. Not for you, listener. You'll be getting this out on the Thursday or the Friday. We're we're doing this a day earlier due to the uh, the Easter weekend. As normal, a quick roundup of some of the news lines uh, from this week so far. Wednesday morning, we've had news that British house builders have come to a firm agreement with the UK government to eradicate flammable cladding on buildings over 11 metres high. Uh, under the agreement, 35 developers have committed a minimum £2 billion spend to fix their own buildings, plus an estimated £3 billion over the next 10 years via a government levy. GlaxoSmithKline have agreed a deal to acquire Sierra Oncology at $55 a share, implying a total value of $1.9 billion. Uh, The US firm develops late-stage biopharmaceutical treatments for rare forms of cancer. Elsewhere, despite a £550 million loss, EasyJet have marked down their latest report as progress, especially given uh, losses last year hit the £700 million mark. Demand also seems to be recovering. During the second quarter of 2022, capacity has reached 67% of 2019 levels, uh, while the third quarter is expected to hit 90%. Alongside EasyJet, we've got updates from Treat, Audio Boom, Page Group, Microlyze, Nanoco, Go Ahead, Tesco, and ASOS in this week's magazine and on the IC website. You can find them all there. Uh, and that brings us nicely onto our first topic and our result of the week. Uh, I just mentioned it there. And uh, Maddie joins us to talk ASOS. Uh, last month, ASOS announced they'd be pulling out of Russia, uh, if, uh, if that's an OK place to start. How, how large were its Russian operations, uh, AK? What's, what's the damage there? Yeah, so at the moment, it seems like it will be fairly limited, the damage. Um, so Russian sales only accounted for 4% of their overall sales which is, you know, in comparison, their UK sales are much larger. They're sort of 45% of the total revenues. So it's it's not huge, but it still will hit profits. Management have sort of kept the profit expectations for the year the same, but now it's expected that they'll definitely come in at the lower end of the expectations. So expecting a £14 million uh, hit to the profits. Elsewhere in the results, I mean, what are, what are some of the other some of the other takeaways from them? Well, one of the things that investors have really been looking at is how retailers are going to hold up in a much more challenging environment. So we've seen inflation going absolutely mad recently, um, not just in the UK but also in the US, which yesterday said that inflation had passed eight percent. Um, And with that backdrop, they're obviously expecting that consumers are going to have less money to spend on things like clothes because they're going to be spending it all on things like food and heating, where the inflation has been the highest. Um, And so that's obviously posed a bit of a risk to ASOS. So far, they have managed to keep sales growing. So in the UK, sales growth was at 8% in the past six months and 11% growth in the US as well. So it's looking fairly positive. Um, In addition, their chief operating officer, Matt Dunn, also said that he was expecting to see this pent-up demand from COVID be unleashed over the second half of the year. So it's yet to be seen whether that will happen, but he's predicting higher sales of what they call occasion wear, which is things like dresses, uh, but also beach wear for holidays and all those things that we've not been able to do for quite a while. Um, So they seem to have it under control for now, but the question really is whether or not they're going to be able to 
offset the rising costs with those extra sales because they've also seen their operating costs rise really rapidly. I, I, I guess it's an interesting uh, environment for retailers like ASOS because they're they are sort of a, a budget brand, I guess, um, mm. which could do well in in these high inflation times compared to more more luxury ones. Is that is is that fair or? Yeah, I mean, their tagline is that they target fashion loving twenty somethings, um, and you know you can see that two ways really. I mean, one is that you know younger people are typically they typically have less disposable income anyway because they're on lower incomes. And so they might potentially be the ones to absorb the biggest hit if inflation keeps running really high. So you could see that as an even higher risk, the fact that they are a budget retailer. It's because it's their consumers that are going to be hit the hardest. Um, and so, you know, in the past, you have seen luxury brands uh, have a little bit more of an advantage there in terms of uh, holding up against inflation. I, I read an interesting piece from, a, from an analyst the other day who I think had probably teenage or, or children in, in their 20s. And he said that because often these people might still live at home and don't aren't bearing those extra costs for inflation like energy costs, um, they're actually going to keep buying trainers and other, you know, kind of uh, fast fashion stuff um, longer than, you know, people might a bit older or people who are more exposed to, you know, realities of life would mm. do. I mean... I mean, you know, once again, he struck me as a as a as a parent who was complaining rather than writing a real rigorous look at this. But you know, do you think there's an element of that where where this kind of spending could continue more than we think? Possibly, but then again, you've got to also balance it out against the fact that we've just come out of the pandemic. So, I mean, a lot of the people that probably were living with their parents over the course of the pandemic have moved back to the cities they've moved back to london where you know house prices have continued to rise rents have continued to rise so it's really anyone's guess well could i just um pitch in on the on the fashion uh, discussion here as well because uh i i saw a separate note which uh, i mentioned to alex the other day about um the cost push inflation that's going to come through because of the disruption to the uh cotton uh, the cotton industry because of the the war in Ukraine and also because of uh, other supply supply side issues as well. So we could we could see that um, that end of the fashion market, uh, fast fashion as it were, uh, becoming that much more expensive and therefore um, perhaps out of the reach of its uh, target audience. But does that mean a t-shirt goes from being five quid to six quid? I mean, this is this stuff's it's just so cheap. That. Well, it, it is cheap as well. I mean, you know, perhaps it, it, it could work either way, I guess, on that basis. But um, and and to your point before, Alex, as well, is that um, research has suggested that people actually will uh, keep on buying small luxuries, as it were, during uh, periods of downturn. And it's the larger the larger purchase items that uh, tend to suffer disproportionately. Um I should have known better, actually, to pitch in on the on the fashion argument. Uh, <laughs> if anyone anyone who knows me personally, it's not. You're wearing a you're wearing a very nice heart. jumper. It, it's, a knit. it's a cable knit. It's a cable knit. It's quite expensive, actually. But uh, <laughs> I've uh, seen on screen. Yes, on our screens. Not yes, on your screens. Uh, <laughs> Our listeners will have to uh, make do with their imagination. I think. <laughs> I, I, I was going to I was going to add to that. I mean, similarly, a bit of a bit of a fashion um outcast as well myself but i mean i suppose for for investors asos was for a long period it was seen as it basically the the aims most triumphant it's, i mean it's now it's i believe it's moved to the main market or at least had uh yeah a, a couple of months ago but it, it was its growth was absolutely phenomenal it, up to about 2014 it had you know it had one of the largest share price appreciations of the a market has probably ever ever seen, um, but but some of the structural elements of the business model, which it, you know advantages it, it had there, so it didn't have the high street presence. It had a kind of viral factor by being on all online. It just it's just that's not a distinguishing factor anymore. Every, every retailer, fashion retailer, has really had to adjust and invest in their 
uh, either the direct consumer um, shipping channels uh, or basically bulking up their, their presence on, on social media and, and kind of replicating some of the early success that, that ASOS and others had. And so the risk really, I mean, they're not the company, they can't return to the, the, the roots they had as a company when they were really, really successful. I, I think, you know, they, you know, they're obviously, they're, they've been incredibly successful in, you know, picking the, the, the stock that, that, um, you know, people are going to want to buy in the, you know, for, for this season and next. But the risk is they are just kind of becoming increasingly more in an increasingly crowded marketplace. And they're almost, you know, they're still very, they're still very big. So comparison with the supermarkets is probably not fair. Um, but, you know, their, you know, their margins, you know, are, are just going to be more and more challenged as they compete with, you know, this kind of ever growing online marketplace for fashion. Um, I don't think, I don't think the same numbers of, of um, consumers will look to them as the first port of call as they once maybe did, uh, yeah, you know, even yeah, there, five years ago. Is it, there's another uh, uh, thematic angle as well that we've uh, become aware of, and um, that's linked to the environmental impact of the fashion industry. Um, I read some figures uh, a little while ago suggesting that it is one of the, uh, the main contributors to greenhouse gas emissions uh, when you take it through right from the production stage you know right uh, for, well from the primary stage right through to production and it whether this will sort of impact companies within the sector whether ESG mandates will be brought to bear eventually or whether young people might just turn around one day if this becomes widely known and accepted they just might turn around and uh, and, and stop buying from these type of uh, outlet sort of disposable fashion as it were I've, I've seen i've seen some advertising for companies that um are basing their business model on, on the fact that it's far more that their apparel is far more environmentally friendly but as i say it's a, it's a thematic angle and it, it's the type of thing that you uh, you need to be really um uh, keep an eye on as, as the industry progresses I mean, as our as our retail writer, Maddie, what's your sense on that? Well, I think you've obviously got to be really careful about the environmental risks. I mean, you look at what happened to Boohoo. I think it was last year. Um, they got themselves embroiled in a, a massive scandal about one of their. Uh, I think it was it was referred to as a sweatshop by others, mm. but they're one of their garment manufacturing facilities in the UK. It was found to be paying uh, some of its workers not very well, shall we say. Or a subcontractor, so when it gets sued right away. Yeah, So, and, and we obviously saw a massive hit to the share price then too, so it is something we've got to look at and always be thinking about. I guess just, just finally, maybe from an investor's point of view, you put a hold rating uh, on ASOS, Maddie, and you also cited uh, Berenberg, who did slash their target price, but it's still... Way above where you know where the price is now. What is is there a is there a more positive investment case for um, for ASOS? Well, I think it's a balancing act, really, because you, as as we've said, their share price went up hugely over the course of the pandemic, and I think over the past year we've really seen that come back down to earth. It's fallen by about two thirds, and so now it's, it's sort of value. It is looking like it's better value than it once was. And I think investors have to keep in mind that it can't compete on the same sort of metrics that it was last year because of things like online retail no longer being kind of your only option, um, which was obviously a massive boost for them. Um, so I think I think we've got to be careful before ruling them out completely, uh, but also admit that there's a really challenging sort of six to 12 months at least ahead. Want to know if you're on the right track to achieve your portfolio goals? Does your mix of holdings have the potential to deliver powerful growth? Are there adjustments you could make to boost your returns? If you would like to see your portfolio analysed by experts, please email us at portfolio.clinic at ft.com for more information or follow the link in the podcast description. This is a free investment review service and all portfolio submissions are welcome, whether you're starting out or have amassed millions. We don't reveal details of the portfolio owners, so your anonymity is guaranteed. That's portfolio.clinic at ft.com. 
or follow the link in the podcast description. Let's move on. Uh, and uh, this week, our, our lead feature uh, for the magazine was written by one Alex Hamer. Uh, a wash with cash, will, mi- will flush miners opt for deals, developments or dividends is, uh, is the title, sort of blaring out from you from the, from the front of your magazine, um, accompanied by a picture of a truck carrying stacks of cash. Alex, you, you sort of you wrote that the miners would historically make moves into uh, M&A, but this this time around that that might not be the case yeah yeah that's that's not the case so far um and i guess the 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 real i guess i mean there are two main points to this firstly the idea is that will they just continue on with massive dividends because they've hit record payouts so far um this year and i think last year um as well it just kind of keeps ramping up um and then the, the second part is that the the big miners like rio and bhp um Glencore, um, Anglo-American, they talk so much about these future commodities um, that will be part of the energy transition. So like copper, nickel, um, there's a bit of lithium development going on as well. Um, and in a way, they're, they're pitching themselves to broader generalist investors who are interested in this stuff, um, who might then invest on the basis of, you know, metal from a new mine that's you know, operationally low emissions, blah, 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 um, going into the next generation of Teslas. Um, you know, it's linked to that supply chain. I think that's that's a massive pitch they're, they're making right now. But they're also not making the decisions now that we'll see supply of those metals be consistent um, in 10 years' time. And that's largely because the institutional investors, um, you know, your, your pension funds, your... Um, you know, kind of small percentage point holders of these companies um, are keen to get these massive dividends, um, as you would be as an investor. You know, yields are running fairly hot, even with quite good valuations. Um, and so what we've also seen, so on the one hand, you've got really high dividends, you've got good balance sheets, and then you've got capital expenditure or CapEx that, has not really moved up that much um, since the bear market, um, which ended about 2016. So from 2017 onwards, you've got kind of minor increases in CapEx. And that what that's meant is that free cash flow has exploded. And, that, and that's where we're talking about use of capital and, and, and what decisions they're making now um, and how that'll affect the future. It, I mean, it's a, it's a big topic and it will kind of keep rumbling along um, and I think the, the 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 comparison really is oil and gas, where investor pressure and a shift of capital away from this you know dirty old industry has meant that oil and gas supply has not kept up with demand um, coming out of COVID, and so we've seen price shocks. And you know, there's good reason that that investors want a bit of um, of um, restraint in terms of spending um but will it go too far i guess is the question and i don't really answer it which is the thing with all you know with all big big kind of analysis pieces like this um but yeah it's a it, it it's a tricky question and i think the investors i spoke to are very happy right now um and that will probably mean that dividends continue as long as they can is the fact that they're flush with with cash is that based solely on the sort of exploding prices of, of commodities or, or or does it go deeper and a bit further back than that? Yeah, yeah, no, that's a that's a good basic question. Um, it's, so for example, copper, which is uh, probably 10, 20% of Rio and BHP's um, cash profits a year has, has gone from under $6,000 a tonne to over $10,000 a tonne. So that's a huge difference. And their costs have crept up a little bit recently, but that's that's contributed a lot over the past two years iron ore has gone from under a hundred dollars to over two hundred dollars and it's back a bit now but that has really driven this this as well um so yeah it's it's price driven but they were in a really good position to capitalize off on these higher prices because during the down the downturn they slashed costs 
and got rid of expensive projects and really focused on, you know, cutting debt and, and, and making themselves a lot leaner. So that has also contributed to this, to this free cash flow bonanza that we're seeing right now. Uh, Alex, I think another uh, point worth mentioning as well is that uh, in the last um, uh, the last cycle, the last super cycle, if you like, a, a lot of the the big resource companies made some pretty um, unwise ac- acquisitions during that period as well, and I think there was pressure from shareholder groups in the wake of that to actually, as you say, uh, you know, improve efficiencies within the companies, but also to avoid, avoid those type of marquee deals that were, um, you know, conducted at, at the, the top of the market. Exactly. Yeah. That, that, uh, it's kind of a, a key point here when you've got Rio is my favorite example where they, they bought a, a coal project in Mozambique that was based on the ability to ship that coal down a river. And when the government said, actually, you can't do that, it was an immediate multi-billion dollar write down. Mm -hmm. And they took their time telling investors, which has gotten them into um, snafu with the uh, SEC in the US and other regulatory authorities. But that's, that's really what investors are also trying to avoid. You know, the market gets excited and then decides that demand is going to stay what it is forever. And then they're going to spend billions on new projects and then, you know, ruin the market again. So... I think there's this idea right now that without doing that, then the, the cycles will kind of flatten, um, which seems seems unlikely, but it's kind of staying so far. Um, but I mean, you know, putting a putting a, a mining truck full of cash on the front cover of the magazine could also just be pure peak market behaviour. <laughs> this could this could be the apex, and all these questions of of continued free cash flow will be, you know, rendered silly within a few months. I mean, there's, there are some forecasts that show that, that BHP's free cash flow is, is topping out this year, um, at just over $20 billion. Uh, and then it's going back down to 15 by, by 2024. And the, you know, Rio and Anglo-American have similar forecasts. Glencore will, will stay a bit longer because of the, the potential for, for, copper and coal prices, which kind of determine their earnings um, a bit longer. But and it, well, presumably it's also making a killing trading unless it gets completely stung in some opaque market we're yet to find out about. Yeah, yeah. Well, the idea at the moment is that that trading has become a real trading ground for, well, well playing ground just for the giant companies because yeah. no one else can handle the margin calls. Um, but, but yeah, it... it there, there is this real sense that miners cannot be trusted with with all this capital, so the investors should have it. Um, yeah. How much do you see that as just quite a short term approach? You know, doing massive shareholder distributions, it's almost too easy. Yeah, it's a it's 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 an interesting one because, as as I was saying, they've they've made these bad bets before, and the question is whether you know the the right time to do these big deals you know, buying mines that could be in production within a few years instead of a decade, for example, is, is kind of what what could be happening, is that these deals should have been done two, three years ago. Which makes it, that, that makes me think on that point, sorry to buy it now, um, the Anglo-Americans serious minerals deal is looking quite good now, I think. I, I mean, it's obviously no consolation to the many serious minerals shareholders out there who kind of took an absolute bath, but I mean, potash market is sort of crumbling as we as we speak and they have this enormous resource which everyone's urging them to speed up uh, i mean that i mean that looks that looks like but you know that could have been a perfectly timed example of a of the sort of deal you're talking about yeah definitely and i mean they they got it for you know cents on a dollar so yeah it was kind of perfect for, for anglo um and i think one other aspect is that um so mo if we talk about copper, for example, which is, you know, so key for the energy transition, most of the current massive mines that are multi-million tons a year were discovered, those deposits were discovered in the 1980s or earlier. Um, and there's been a few other big discoveries since then. Um, that I think I mentioned on the pod the other week, um, big one in the DRC, but there, there aren't kind of 
15 large scale copper projects just in a supermarket for the miners to go and go and buy. And those that are pretty good are very, very expensive. So am I right in thinking as well as that general um, yields uh, are going down within copper and uh, a number of other industrial inputs? Yeah, for sure. The, the, so, so the overall grade of copper globally is declining and there are some processing um, helps that, are, you know, so new processing styles and, and they're, they're still getting better at that, um, at actually getting the copper out of the rock. So that, that does help. But if your grade drops, that's, that's pretty serious. Um, so globally, it, it, it's definitely an issue. Um, and there's really interesting things in nickel. So um, Russia produces, um, I think, 20% of the world's high grade nickel, which is what is traded on the LME and is used in, in, in batteries like those in, in Tesla's. Um, and then your alternative is to, to, to mine a different type of nickel from Indonesia and then put, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars of electricity, um, into turning it into a better grade or, or a better, better type for, for those applications. And, and that has massive environmental implications as well. Um, so there, there are quite short term questions about Russian supplies uh, as well, but then longer term questions about where you're going to get, you know, the future demand for this stuff, or when you where you're going to get future supply for this stuff with with such high demand forecast. And like the you know the the committees looking at any new project as well. It's just I mean the world is just getting more and more complicated, isn't it? It's like you know who are your supply is going to be. We're not, you know, I don't know, if, you know, if it's it's overdone the idea that we're deglobalizing uh, or in this multipolar world but it, it just everything becomes so much more complicated when you know the the dollar system is a weapon and so like if you're if you pick the wrong location then that's going to be that's going to be massive equity wipe out Rio Tinto's experience in Mongolia just goes to show how complicated it is dealing with governments now we've got rising inflation so there's added political pressure on any state to get a really good deal it's uh, it's like, you know why not just give the dividends away rather than <laughs> have, have have to deal with the incredibly complex judgments involved in like building a new mine yeah and and the the, the mining industry used to talk about tier one jurisdictions which was yeah. basically Canada Australia the US um, you know Chile on a good day um, but now you've got so BHP and Rio own together this. Uh, this project called Resolution Copper, which was kind of a, seen as a as a slam dunk, they've already dug a kilometer or more deep shaft into the ground, but now because they treated um, at an Apache sacred site without due respect, so that they basically done a land slot with the U.S. government to take this sacred First Nations land, and now the project's in question because they, you know, what what happened in Australia with Juhan Gorge, there's a greater focus on this. On, on you know not being horrible um, to First Nations groups and now this massive copper project in Arizona which was seen as super easy if not quite expensive is now in question um, because of the way they've handled um, this Apache site and so yeah so so you're getting you know I'm, I'm, I'm kind of furthering your point saying that even in previous, in places where previously you'd assume the project would go ahead um, on purely economic grounds. Now that's also in question. Mm. Well, thanks, Alex. That's uh, that's your feature, a wash with cash. Available magazine, website, uh, all, all good retailers, etc., etc. You know, you know the spiel. Um, right, we're going to move on to our to our uh, our final topic. Um, now the UK defence and aviation industry looks like it's uh, it could be losing another of its uh, members. On Monday, the European Commission approved US engineer Parker Hannafin's acquisition of uh, the UK-based aerospace manufacturer Megat. Um, I believe there are a couple of antitrust stumbling blocks, but uh, I think if if Parker sets its aircraft wheel and breaks division free it, to be its own separate entity, that's uh, that's all well and good. I believe that was the the commission's. Uh, statement. Um, anyway, the upshot is um, the UK government and business secretary Kwasi Kwarteng has a decision to make over whether this is an issue of national sec security before approving uh, the deal. 
Mark, lots of lots of news lines around this one, uh, and you wrote about it very briefly in a, in a market roundup. Um, what do what do the UK government have to weigh up here, um, especially in light of of the ultra electronics case as well? Um, well, um, there's a, there's a number of considerations um, all linked to national security concerns. I mean, this is a a debate that's been going on well before the uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine as well. Uh, the UK, almost uniquely amongst European nations, uh, didn't have uh, provisions in place to stop foreign takeovers of um, industries that were deemed deemed essential in terms of uh, national security. But I think there's been a, a sea change in that regard. The government has actually um, uh, given powers to regulators to uh, to stop deals on this basis. And I think a lot of people were actually surprised that the mega and uh, ultra electronics deals were um, allowed to go ahead in, in the first place as well. I mean, this, the central irony, of course, is that uh, you know Cobham is involved as well. Itself, uh, uh, a venerable UK defence company. Uh, it's it's just a case of the, the, the there's such a tie up as well between the government in this country and the defence contractors uh, through links with GCHQ and with the military itself. And so, what well, you've got a position now where. Uh, We've seen the we've seen this, the value of uh, UK armaments in uh, the Ukraine war, and uh, it, it is just a simple question: Is it worth is it worth sort of hiving off this, you know, intellectual property to third parties, which in some cases will sell that on to nations that um, uh, are essentially hostile to uh, Western interests? So um, it'll be interesting to see what the the business secretary does in in relation to that deal. Uh, I, I guess it's you could say that it's so far down the path now that it, it's likely to gain approval. Uh, uh, and you know the, the central irony it, it, it'll only leave about four FTSE 350 companies in, in the defence stroke uh, aerospace aerospace sector. Um, so, in, in a sense, the argument is moot, but um, uh, we, we shall see. At any rate, we shall see. Uh, I, I pointed out a few weeks ago as well that uh, we, we might see further consolidation in the UK market, but of course, that's uh, that's a different kettle of fish. Is there precedent for the the UK business secretary or the UK government? Sort of vetoing sales on on the grounds of national defence. Well, I, da- I dare say there's there's more than one example, but I, I just think you know in comparison. But it's 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 been pointed out that in comparison to other European nations, for a long time we didn't have those provisions which uh, st- stopped sort of key national ass- assets being sold off under uh, the national secu- over national security concerns. Um, I mean, I mean a lot of the a lot of the UK's, um, a lot of the UK's IP in this regard are, are centred on uh, two larger companies within the sector as well. So, um, I guess, you know, when when you look at how I think the the UK is at right about the eighth largest arms exporter in the world, and it's been going down the list in that regard. I think we've got something like two point eight percent against France's eleven uh, percent. So um, some people, some people might say, you know, what what is the relevance of it then? But I've, the the UK defence, UK defence contractors, by definition, are um, are tech focused. So it, it tends to be at the, the higher end of um, uh, areas like aviation and uh, electronic warfare, which, which uh, and also. Um, and I say aviation, but autonomous, <clears throat> autonomous drones. I mean, we're almost ahead of the curve in, in that regard. And it is the, you know, if you're a company like the Czech Republic, they they, they produce a lot of arms, but it, it, it's the kind of thing that anyone can produce, you know, rifles, um, ammunition, things that are absolutely vital, but they don't have the same import in terms of uh, intellectual property. Well, uh, thanks, Mark. Um, 
something to keep an eye on. I'm sure you'll be keeping an eye on over the uh, over the coming weeks. John, what, what's it good for? <laughs> a good question. Good question. Um, great. Well, well, thanks everyone for for joining me. Hope you all have uh, have a crack in Easter, and we'll catch up with you again uh, same time next week. The Companies and Market Show was edited and produced by me, John Rogers. And because you listen to our show, you can try all the IC's print and digital subscription at the special price of just £4 for four weeks. Follow the link in the show description to redeem. Have a great Easter weekend and we'll see you next week.